whether he found it boring or interesting. I'm sure, like myself, he found it as part of his routine learning in St. Thomas. I'm sure, like yourselves, he had much more important things to think about, such as what's for lunch today, or was that a penalty last night? Was that really a penalty? Just like yourselves at school, he was dealing with the garden pea, the fruit flies, the lettuce seeds that you're all dealing with now in your level projects, dissecting rats, and I'm sure he thought, what is this all about? You know, where does this apply to real life? The interesting thing is, of course, that when you go on to your career in medicine or science, it is important. An awful lot of, lot of what we do in our jobs, whether it's a GP, myself, or a professor of oncology, it is important that you learn that around work. That you do actually get the opportunity to apply that knowledge. I, I would report to my maths teacher, so that I, I, I have never applied any of my pure maths, differentiation, integration. What? What was that about? I, I just haven't applied. That's statistics now. I will point out the statistics are very important. But so, so Professor Johnson, like yourselves, learned all this basic science at school. He then went off to University College Dublin to follow his career in medicine. From there, he went off to the National Institute of Health in America where he started in cancer research, particularly in the genetic field, and won a number of prestigious awards there, including the Young Investigator Award. And he then came from America and came back home to Northern Ireland to his post in, as the uh, director of the Cancer Centre. And that's, <clears throat> just to point out, this is not a, an ordinary job, he's in as the Professor of Oncology. He's not sitting there lecturing and doing just uh, egghead work over here with paperwork. He's actually the director of the Cancer Centre. This is the most important post in Northern Ireland in terms of improving the quality of life and outcomes for cancer patients in Northern Ireland. This is real medicine, making a real difference in our community. So his talk today on cancer in the genome age, we'll hear how his knowledge and research into the genome has been applied to the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. Professor Johnson will hopefully give us an insight into how the field of cancer research, research is going to develop over the next 20 or 30 years. So I'll stop talking now, give you over to the main speaker, and I welcome Professor Johnson to the podium. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, um, Father Eamon, and uh, members of the college and members of other schools, and to my own family members that are here. Um, thank you for coming. Um, Tom, uh, you're too generous in your comments about me, uh, but all you said about me, actually, in terms of when I was at St. Collins, is actually very true. One of the key things, however, um, that not walking out the door 29 years ago, I recognized, but I certainly have recognized very much since, as I further developed, was the foundation that I developed here became very important in the type of individual, as well as the type of scholastic individual and medical doctor that I became. And I owe a great debt of gratitude to the school teachers who were here, and probably now gone, and some of who are still here, in relationship to the contributions that I and the others have made to society, both here and worldwide. Um, what I'm going to do today um, is actually take you on a journey, one which in actual fact is a vision of the future, because what has happened both in Northern Ireland and indeed worldwide in the Western world over the course of the last decade and a half, two decades, has been a revolution. And it's a revolution actually not only in cancer care, but it's also a revolution in medicine, which is very much typified by what's happening in cancer. 
And I think one of the challenges that in a sense I want to place in front of you, because in essence some of you sitting in this room today are the people who are actually going to enact and actually bring about those advances that are going to uh, both empower medicine and also benefit people, benefit patients and their families, and in ways that we currently cannot do. And so what I want to share with you today is actually a challenge, one of which I am placing currently in front of the Department of Health, not only in Northern Ireland, but also in the Republic of Ireland, um, in the US and several other countries, along with others. Because this is going to be an international challenge, but one that we can actually already see, and one that we can actually begin to shape. My talk is going to really divide into three major areas. The first is looking at changing the clinical paradigm. In other words, we've been trained as medical doctors, we practice medicine a certain way today, but because of the advances and the rapid rate of advance that we're beginning to see in genomics and proteomics, that is the study of genes, the study of proteins, uh, also new technologies that are advancing our capability, we actually now are at a point where we have to ask the fundamental question, is the manner in which we actually think about the practice of medicine correct today or not? Uh, and I will put forward my own views on that. We then have to look at what those scientific and clinical challenges are as we actually advance this, how they have begun to impact, uh, but also how they actually begin to allow us to address new questions and of course through that raise very important new issues, some of which we haven't had to deal with uh, historically. And finally, I want to finish with what I believe the implications are for clinical practice. Uh, and I'm not talking about 20 years or 30 years hence, I'm actually talking about now. Now, cancer, as uh, Tom has already said, is a major, major problem for society as a whole. In the world today, there are 10.1 million new cancer cases diagnosed each year. There are 6.2 million deaths from cancer. And across the world, there are 22.4 million people living with cancer. There are many reasons for that. People are living longer. Um, diseases that killed, in particular, children and young adults are actually beginning to disappear. And so we're beginning to see diseases, and in particular, diseases such as cancer, that are associated with longevity and having a longer life. Northern Ireland is not immune from this. Um, in actual fact, in Northern Ireland each year, we have a very significant and very high rate of cancer. This will continue to grow. We have approximately 8,700 uh, people who are diagnosed with cancer each year. We also have 3,500 people dying from cancer each year. We have 10, 10 cancer deaths per day. And currently in Northern Ireland alone, there are approximately 22,500 people who actually live with cancer. One in 2.5 men will develop cancer in their lifetime, and one in three women will be diagnosed with the disease. So you can see, as diseases such as heart disease, um, diabetes, uh, infectious diseases start to fall off in terms of their incidence and indeed cause of mortality, um, the burden of cancer gets greater and greater. However, the news is not all bad. In actual fact, one of the things that we have begun to see in Northern Ireland over the last decade is significant improvements in outcomes in certain diseases. So for example, in the late 1980s, a woman with breast cancer in Northern Ireland only had a 68% chance of being alive in five years. A woman today in Northern Ireland has an 83 to 84% chance of being alive in five years. There are similar stories for ovarian cancer, uh, as well as for colorectal cancer. Um, and hopefully, around the corner, we will see similar advances for lung cancer. Um, two years ago, um, the director of the National Cancer Institute in the United States, which is the institution that I spent uh, virtually 10 years at, the director of this institute, which is the largest single research institute in the world with an annual budget, of $26.5 billion per year, um, came out with a statement to the medical community in the US and also to the international cancer community. 
And that was that he set a goal to eliminate the suffering and death due to cancer in the US, but challenged us internationally to do this back 2015. That's just 10 years away. He also wanted us to serve as, in this process to serve as a model for how the elimination of suffering and death due to cancer worldwide might actually take root. Here in Northern Ireland, we have responded to that by agreeing, as some of you will know, to begin to significantly decrease the suffering and death due to cancer in Northern Ireland by the year 2015. And I stress suffering and death because we're not only about curing disease, as you'll see later, we're about improving the quality of the patient and the family's life as well. The other important promise that we've made here is that we would participate nationally and internationally in the elimination of that suffering. And that is a very important context for us to begin to see ourselves in as we develop sophisticated and important um, clinical programs that deliver the highest quality of care that we in ourselves actually can become ambassadors to best practice or for best practice internationally. And again, that process has already begun and will be continued uh, when we actually develop and open the new cancer centre next year. So what's the real challenge if we are to achieve that? Well, the real challenge is the following, that we must shift the clinical paradigm. And we must shift the clinical paradigm such that we actually go for cancer as a curable and chronic disease rather than cancer as a killer disease. And my own view is that that has already started and should be enhanced. And it will be enhanced through programs, which I'll allude to in a minute, that actually bring forward prevention in the molecular age, effective elimination of cancer at its earliest point. And where that is not possible, modulation of that cancer and the growth of that cancer in such a way that in actual fact the patient can have a really relatively normal lifespan and good quality of life. How are we going to do this? Well, one of the revolutions, as I will show you later, has actually been that our understanding of cancer has actually come a long way. Tom alluded to my lectures here in relationship to the Watson Crick hypothesis and to the DNA uh, double helix. I remember them very, very well. It was actually a pleasure then when I worked at NIH to actually work alongside John Watson for a period of two weeks when he actually came as a visiting pro a professor from Cold Spring Harbor. But the reality was that was crude, and that was only 29 years ago. The reality is our understanding of double helix DNA was incredibly crude compared to what we now know today. And so the revolution that has happened has actually given us a fundamental understanding of what goes on at a cellular and molecular level. So what goes on within each individual cell, and indeed what goes in and goes on within the actual individual compartments of that cell, such as the mitochondria, such as the nucleus, such as the ribosomes. Um, this information has then allowed us, and I should demonstrate this later, to begin to understand how the complexity of one cell interacting with another affects the human, affects the person, affects the patient. And more importantly then, as we've begun to understand that genetic background that drives those cellular processes, we've also begun to better understand how populations are put at risk for developing cancer. So we're able to define why certain chemicals, why certain viruses, why certain diets actually begin to interact with both the genetic and molecular backbone in such a way that they heavily predispose certain high-risk groups to certain types of cancer. Now, because of this information, we can actually begin to draw the following clinical paradigm. One that is a challenge to every member of society, not only to the clinical um, community. 
Because if you actually believe this paradigm that I'll outline in just a minute, you actually, as an individual, begin to have a, a degree of responsibility for your own health and indeed the detection and treatment of cancer. Currently, we're all born and we actually at some point in life will die. That's a natural life. And we have to recognize, and in, in some aspects of the medical profession I think we've lost sight of this, that there is a natural human journey that goes from birth to death. What we are not about doing in terms of trying to defeat cancer is actually do the impossible. That is, change natural death. What we are about doing is actually trying to defeat and actually change those deaths that, take, that are due to cancer at earlier stages in life. So we now have the setting where women are alive, median age 78, men roughly 74, 75. Okay, do we actually need everybody to live to 100 years old? The answer to that is probably not. But what we don't want is to have 40 and 50 year olds succumbing to disease at a stage when they actually have a much more and a lot more to give to society and at a point where they can really contribute. So our treatment today for cancer is largely in this arena. And it's largely in this arena because of resources, because of our understanding. This is the metastatic cancer or the locally advanced cancer. That's what these cells represent. However, now one of the challenges is to actually take this paradigm and shift it right over here so that we actually begin to develop and understand and characterize the genetic susceptibility backbone in normal populations, in normal human beings. And the reason that we should do that is that in actual fact, if we actually need to intervene here with treatments or with staying away from cigarettes or certain types of food or whatever, then in actual fact, we will ultimately put off precancerous changes for a much longer period. And I'll show you that in just a minute. The other important component is that, as some of you know, we are already beginning to detect, de detect pre-malignant changes. And we're beginning to ask in diseases such as prostate cancer, in colorectal cancer, and indeed in lung cancers and bronchial neoplasms and, and preneoplasms, how do we treat these? And we're beginning, even in breast cancer, the same thing, to detect these at a stage that weren't in the textbooks when Tom and I went through medical school. Actually, they weren't even there a decade and a half later. So the reality is that we're now beginning to deal with diseases at a much earlier stage. And of course, as we begin to do that, then the reality is that the outcomes are going to become significantly better. And the reason for that is that we won't be dealing with very late events where the actual treatments become much more aggressive or much harder to deal with, both from the patient's point of view, their family, and indeed the treating physician. Now, how are we going to do this? Because this is actually part of the paradigm shift and indeed the mental shift that needs to happen. Well, we're actually going to do this by connecting these three things, prevention, elimination, and modulation, by incorporating genetic susceptibility, defining virulence of cancers, in other words, defining how aggressive they are at a very, very early stage, possibly even pre-diagnosis, and actually then developing chemoprevention. So, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things that will become probably Normal practice over the next five years is actually treatment of patients with a family history of colorectal cancer with aspirin prior to any diagnosis. Why? Because we know that that will actually stop the development of adenomas, which are pre-malignant disease. We have the example of people with breast cancer in their family who, if we actually treat them now with hormonal agents such as tamoxifen for two years or indeed for five years, that we may actually prevent high-risk populations from actually getting that disease. And much better to be doing that with a non-toxic type agent so that those patients actually then suddenly have a shift in terms of the cancer lifespan that actually goes like this. It develops later on, but its burden is decreased 
and of course the interventions become much more effective. And that's a challenge to society, as I will outline a little later. It's, an out, it's a challenge not only to society, it's a challenge to the clinical community, and it's also a challenge to many of the legal and ethical issues that come around all of this. We're very much focused right now as a treatment community on elimination. We detect disease based on clinical diagnosis and certain diagnostic tests. We are very quickly moving to molecular detection, defining disease in a molecular way, and actually in that, also around that, beginning to actually ablate the disease at its earliest point then. We also, of course, very excitingly, have now got an armamentarium which is much, much more vast than anything that I've ever seen before, and that's only come about in the last decade, that actually controls metastatic disease. So the patients who had disease that had spread to the liver from, let's say, the colon, or disease that had spread to the bone from the lung, or disease that had spread to the um, bone from the breast, that those patients can actually begin to have a full, very active life their disease can be controlled and modulated in such a way that they actually feel that they are healthy and contributing members of society. And then you actually begin to achieve this clinical shift and paradigm. Now, one of the major reasons that all of these advances have begun to happen is that we've begun to understand the biological processes involved in the development of cancer and in its um, both genesis as well as its spread throughout the body. This little diagram here is an electron micrograph. It actually shows a cancer cell. It actually shows a breast cancer. And you can see this breast cancer, this is a single breast cancer cell. It's, it's shaped in such a way that it's domed. And these little filia, or filipolia, as you will see, are attaching it to the actual strata or connective tissue. So for any of you who've ever looked at a cross-section or seen a cross-section of a piece of tissue, what you will see is that there is connective tissue and on top of that connective tissue there are what are called epithelial cells. Well, cancer comes from epithelial cells and from other cells. And in actual fact, what it's doing here is it's lying down on the connective tissue. It actually develops these little legs and these do numerous things, they actually connect it to other cancer cells, but it also allows it to actually begin to invade in through that tissue, such that um, these cells can then migrate through this wall, get into blood vessels, and then disseminate or spread to other organs. And it does this through proliferation or increasing its growth potential, through invasion, it also evades the immune system. All of us today, everybody in this room, has abnormal cells in their body. Everybody. And what normally happens is that the immune system, through a, a number of mechanisms, actually senses these, recognizes them, and destroys them. However, when a cell turns malignant, it actually evades the immune uh, system, it recruits other cells, and then begins to grow and disseminate. It also actually can target various types of tissue. So we've now begun to understand why, for example, prostate cancer, which is a disease seen in middle and elderly men, actually goes to bone. And it goes to bone actually, it's a little bit like the bee going after the honey. It's a honing signal, and it's a protein that actually attracts the cells into the milieu of the bone. And the exact same protein, slightly modified, does the same thing for breast cancer cells. And these cells can also then canalize uh, the actual tissue they go into and differentiate them. Now, Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg um, in Boston, uh, about four years ago in Cell, actually wrote a wonderful review article, which any of you who are really interested in this topic, I would actually commend to you to read which actually really outlined the six major aberrations that occur when a cell becomes a cancer cell. And, and in a sense, this is very important, both from a scientific and from a medical treatment point of view. Because the challenge here is this is what you've got to beat. I keep telling people around me is that cancer cells are a hell of a lot smarter than we are. 
And they're a hell of a lot smarter because they're very adaptive and they keep moving and doing different things. The first thing that they learn to do, in my view, is they learn to evade death. They learn, learn to evade pathways that are normally there to kill cells. They also become self-sufficient in growth, so they no longer actually need to develop blood vessels on their own or actually have growth factors. They actually produce growth factors themselves, which are small proteins. They also become very insensitive to things that stop growth. So they actually go like gangbusters uh, when these two things happen. The other thing is cancer cells can actually begin to develop new blood vessels. So a cancer cell in and of itself can actually secrete factors that actually begin to build new blood vessels. And one of those has become a major target for chemotherapy called VEGF. They develop an autonomous regulatory um, type of cycle or cell cycle. Um, cell cycle is when cells divide. They actually you have one cell going to the daughter cell. The Mendelian pattern of inheritance is built on that. And so they can go through mitosis, meiosis, but these cells can actually drive that themselves. They don't need any external stimuli for that. And then finally, um, they learn how to invade and actually get into other tissues. Okay, so what are we doing in Northern Ireland to actually help this international challenge that I've alluded to? Um, it's very good to talk about it, but are we actually doing anything about it here? Well, as I've previously alluded to, one of the reasons that I came back to Northern Ireland was to lead the development of what is called a comprehensive cancer center, which is an integration of clinical research programs, clinical care, basic science, uh, and cancer prevention programs. And I'm happy to say that um, the cancer center, which is, represents a 70 million pound investment uh, in terms of capital investment, but actually in total a 250 million pound investment by the government here, will open on time uh, in January of next year. And this is it, actually. This is the, where all the uh, radiation treatment will be, right here. These are the inpatient wards. This is the Belfast City Hospital Tower. Um, this is actually the current day hospital. Um, and hopefully this will become a very vibrant environment for not only the treatment of patients, but also for the application of new discoveries so that our patients can actually get access to those at the earliest stage. To ensure that that happens, We've also developed a £40 million pound investment in this cancer research building, which will actually sit right across the road from the Clinical Cancer Research Centre. And this will actually house over 350 clinicians and scientists, all working on cancer research and cell biology. And this will open at the start of 2007. And so you can see, Northern Ireland actually is beginning to play a major international leadership role this will be the first comprehensive cancer centre in the United Kingdom, integrating basic science, uh, clinical research and clinical trials in a manner that happens in very few institutions. And the manner in which this will be achieved will be by taking basic research concepts around the cancer cell, developing these through what are called preclinical models, then actually taking those concepts that make sense into what is called translational research into patients. Um, and then from that, actually developing concepts that actually go around the globe to be tested. And in case you think this is, you know, Star Wars or pie in the sky, this is beginning to happen. There are already three international trials that have actually been generated by ideas created here in Belfast that are actually now being developed here internationally. And that's the impact of a comprehensive cancer center, and that's what you want. You want that type of dynamic that actually creates thought throughout the world that will change clinical practice. The major scientific and clinical challenge now relates to three major areas. First of all, technology advances, which have been logarithmic. Novel drug discovery, which is revolutionizing not only cancer, but many other diseases. And the way we get to these how we do clinical trials. One of the biggest um, developments over the last seven or eight years has been the ability to actually screen hundreds of thousands of genes at one time. 
When I started working in the lab back in 1989 at the National Cancer Institute, um, it took us three days, possibly four, to actually be able to look at the expression of one gene. 